This is a Media Lab podcast. Oh, Kyle, uh, your floor is covered in frogs again. I know this is cr- this is crazy. There's first there is witches, and now there's runes, and now we have frogs just all over the place. I, I don't even know how they got in here. At least it smells better than usual. Actually, now that the more I look at them, maybe they're toads. What's the difference Whoa. between a frog and a toad? Um, the one you can lick. All right. Well, you you take one. I'll take one. <laughs> Let's do this, buddy. Ride or die. Um, um, <laughs> we went fast and furious on this. I'm ready. It's all about family is what I'm trying to say, Dave. <laughs> in his own garage, Kyle has built a machine cobbled together with parts found in his friend's church basement and a dumpster behind the local Dairy Queen. This monstrosity is now alive and evil. Kyle has convinced his friend Dave to help stop the apocalypse by reviewing films the machine picks. The ultimate purpose is still unknown, and Kyle could have probably done this himself, but he's not being dragged to hell alone. This This is is Kyle and Dave versus versus the machine. Welcome to Kyle and Dave versus the Machine. My name is Kyle. And my name is Dave. And I'm the Machine. This is a podcast where a sentient machine forces us to watch movies in order to prevent it from initiating the apocalypse. Although, we do tend to talk about the ideas of the movie rather than the movie itself. Today, we're going to be watching the movie Magnolia. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to read a line to you from an opera. I want you to give me that line back in the language in which the opera was originally written. And for a bonus 250, uh, you can sing it. I'm Stanley Spector. There is the story of a boy genius. Willa Catherine, Thomas Kidd, Jean Baptiste for Clamoyer. And the game show host. I'm Jimmy Gator. Live from Burbank, California. First question for 25. This French playwright and actor joined the Béjar troupe of actors. And the ex-boy genius. I'm Chris Kidd, Donnie Smith. I used to be smart, now I'm just stupid. There is the story of the dying man. I'm Earl Partridge. I have a son, you know. You do? Uh, find him. I'm Frank T.J. Mackey. His lost son. What did he say? Because I am not going to take care of him. What does he want? And the dying man's wife. I'm Linda Partridge. I took care of him through this, Alan. What now, then? Me and him. Do you understand? There's no one else. No one else. The caretaker. Hello. I'm Phil Parma. See, this is uh, the scene of the movie where you help me out. And there is the story of a mother. I'm Rose Gator. You come home soon after the show. I love you. And the daughter. I'm Claudia Wilson Gator. Now that I've met you, would you object to never seeing me again? And the police officer in love. I'm Officer Jim Curry. My life is very stressful, and I'd hope to have a relationship that is very calm and undemanding and loving. So if you are this person, please leave me a message at box number 82. And this will all make sense in the end. So Dave, I think where we need to start off with this is, oh, wait, so we, we have got a knock on the guest door here, Dave. How are you going to open that thing with all the frogs on the oh, floor? Let's, let's, let's squeegee them out of the way. One second. Oh, okay, disgusting. let's open this door. Oh, Justin, uh, welcome. Hey, I, I stepped on so many frogs and I feel nauseous. Well, luckily, the way that uh, my my uh, room setup is, there is a toilet in the corner right next to the stove. Oh, thank, because a- thank God. Because apparently this is a New York flat <laughs> that I live in. Uh, Justin, thank. You. do you have some time to watch the movie Magnolia with us? Magnolia? Watch Magnolia? Yeah. I do this at least once or twice a year anyway, so of course. Oh. Great. I'm so glad you have three hours to spare on this random Friday. <laughs> yeah, there's nothing like sitting down for a, just a short three hour and eight minute movie. <laughs> That's right. Brief jaunt. Just into a brief American. film. <laughs> yeah. Maybe before we jump too far into this, Justin, could you maybe describe who you are and what it is that you do? Yeah. So my name is Justin Bills and I'm a pastor, local pastor here in Calgary. And that's about it. Nice. Kyle's my friend, and I'm a f- yeah. fan of this podcast. But and I Exciting. like the movie Magnolia. <laughs> Everything's converging. Yeah, it's well, all converging. All prerequisites for you to actually be a guest on this show. So I know. I know great. you like clergy <laughs> on the podcast. It's it's a <laughs> hot time. item. We've been talking about it off mic. I mean, we need, yeah. we need more conscience. Yeah, we need a moral direction, Kyle. I mean, when we had that bishop on to talk about Sleepy Hollow, I thought that was our best episode. So. <laughs> Francis won't return our calls. So. Yeah, that's right. Old Frank. 
Uh, yeah, I want to, I guess, start with you here, Justin. What is your history with the movie Magnolia? Yeah, that's an interesting question. I rented it to watch with my mom first. And then uh, we got great family Kyle. viewing. Yes, <laughs> yeah. we got about five minutes in, and she had me turn it off. And then I went a couple of years. So wait, is it what year would that have been? This would have been probably two thousand five, six years after the release. But you would have been what early twenties? Yeah, yeah. I actually I would have been twenty, right on okay. the dot. And then Punch Drunk Love was a movie experience, and so I started becoming a little bit obsessed with Paul Thomas Anderson, P.T. Anderson, I like to call him. Don't we all? So my mom had me turn it off. We rented the VHS, if you can believe that. Wow. That had to have been a double VHS. I, yeah, it probably was. And then I remember yeah. years later getting the DVD. I put it in my laptop and then I was staying at my sister's house and I got locked out and I had to jump the fence and I threw my laptop in a bag over the fence. And I actually uh, broke the laptop so it would never eject the DVD. <laughs> so Magnol there was a 10-year period where the only DVD in my computer was Magnolia. So that's my, re that's my relationship to the movie. Was it still playing, though? You could still watch yeah, it? Yeah, it just wouldn't eject. So it was okay. the only movie, I essentially, I could watch for quite a while. That's hilarious. Like the, the basis of a horror movie. <laughs> this is like, honestly, when you grew up in the 80s or 90s, and you only had a limited amount of tape or DVD that you could actually watch, I think it very much influences you. When I was a kid, there was these like four films that were basically on rotation that I had, no joke, probably each scene 40-ish times, maybe up to 50 times. They were all taped off of the television, uh -huh. but they were Mary Poppins, Bed Knobs and Broomsticks, <laughs> The Flight of the Navigator, and um, Princess Bride. Those are the four movies that I saw so many wow. times as a kid. They basically built Disney Channel for you. Basically, Disney except for Channel, except yeah. for Princess Bride, all three like the it's, other no, three are there. Disney films. But no, it, well, it's on uh, Disney streaming. Disney owns yeah. everything now. Yes, That's but they true. did not originally make that movie. <laughs> did you? Um, As you wish. Flight of the Navigator was quite memorable for me too. Have you watched it on Disney Plus now that that's on I, there? I want to because I have to believe that it does not hold up. <laughs> it is no what way. my guess is going to be. But <laughs> there's no way. Mine, if I can interject, is yeah. did you guys ever get a preview of HBO or some, for like a week? They, sometimes they would do that. No, we didn't get HBO on the farm. Oh, okay. <laughs> because we taped The Net with Sandra Bullock. <laughs> with Sandra Bullock? Sandra Bullock. Uh -huh. yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I've seen The Net probably more than any other movie. <laughs> it's about the internet. Yeah, like, <laughs> and, uh, I know. And the I do feel like this is the beginning of a horror movie. The dangers that can happen on the internet. <laughs> You're like stuck in loops. It's like a Charlie Kaufman film or something. <laughs> yeah, Dave, what, is, what, is the, what are the movies that you saw like the most in your life? Oh, I don't know. We did the same thing with the EP tapes. You can, you can switch the setting on the VCR, so they'll tape for eight hours on right. each cassette. Enter the Dragon was a good one. I think we taped that off of city tv and right. that we broke that tape i don't have to ask my brother my brother's got a much better memory than this but uh we had quite a few cassettes but i don't remember actually specifically which movies we watched over and over again i used to know enter the dragon verbatim but mm -hmm. uh, that time's gone why are you such a buzzkill every week just to finish off the conversation with, what are your feelings towards his later movies afterwards i probably obsessed with paul Th thomas anderson so through Punch Drunk Love, I just started going back. So at the time, it was Magnolia, Boogie Nights, and Sydney, or uh, Part Eight. Part Eight. Part Eight. Yeah. Yeah. And all of his films are really amazing, and, and I love. I to be honest, love them all. There will be blood. Awesome. Loved it. Kyle, yeah. you and I saw The Master in theaters together. Uh, we we also watched Phantom Thread together and in Phantom Thread. And I love those films. There is one glaring P.T. Anderson movie that I hate, and it's called Inherent Vice. And I just, I left and I just went, well, there's one P.T. Anderson movie I can't stand, and it's Inherent Vice. I will never watch that movie again. I just didn't like it. I, I will say, though, you and I probably enjoy the master more than most people do so uh, that, that's, yeah. at least that's my sense yeah i love the master yeah 
Okay, well, Dave, how about yourself? I guess start with Magnolia. What's your history with Magnolia? I didn't watch this uh, in 1999, and I, too, rented it. Uh, Hypothetically, if I had already watched it with Mm -hmm. my wife, you know, two nights ago, uh, I think we watched it together somewhere. Yeah, uh, on a couch. No, no. It had been great though. Is that somehow you and Justin's stories had intersected, and when he threw his uh, laptop over the fence, it actually hit you in the head, <laughs> and you were the reason why it, that DVD stayed in that uh, laptop for so long. It's, it's plausible. I wasn't in a good. I wasn't in a good place in 1999 by the end <laughs> sure. of the year. So I might have been here. I don't know. Yeah. So I remember that it was supposed to be really good. I remember it's supposed to be very long. And I remember not wanting to spend a lot of time watching a good movie for a long mm-hmm. time. And then uh, whenever we rented it, uh, I remember liking it a lot. And I too uh, was introduced to P.T. Anderson through Punch Drunk Love, which is a great movie. I was a bit of an Adam Sandler fan at the time. And then I watched Heart 8. I still have not watched Boogie Nights. And then uh, I think the last P.T. Anderson movie I watched was There Will Be Blood, which uh, was fine. <laughs> wow all right yeah that's the that's the one i think is his masterpiece personally i think that's a great movie i like that yeah. you came to um punch trunk love as an adam sandler fan like were you expecting the like right. zabba to do zabba da dabba da do <laughs> no you know what uh i uh i was a big enough fan that when the reviews came out and they were talking about well, or even the pre-hype that this was going to be his turn to dramatic acting i think uh Pretty sure already Jim Carrey had shown some range as a comedian. I can't remember if that's true yet Mm -hmm. uh, into drama. So I thought, you know, this guy's uh, might be good. And then in the commercials, it's so absurdist anyways, that there's Mm -hmm. a hint it might be a comedy and then you watch it and it's quite gut punching at the same time. So uh, I really liked it. But yeah, I think I was aware that it wasn't going to be an Adam Sandler produced film. (laughs) It wasn't (laughs) Happy Madison. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah there wasn't a happy madison production which you know it was uh it was the that was the cool thing in the times so, I, I think it would have been even more amazing had it just been exactly what punch drunk love is but in the last five minutes he just turned into like the water boy or, or happy gilmore <laughs> rob schneider rob <laughs> schneider appears yeah, it's, rob kind of schneider cameo. Yeah. <laughs> yeah it's like wait what um so this is wild to me because that means that all three of us our introductory film was punch drunk love because that was also mine i went and saw it in a theater with a girl Ooh. It was wow. a date that we were on, uh, and Ooh. she hated it. Oh, no. <laughs> Absolutely did not like that at all. I was mad that I had su- su- suggested we go and see that movie. And you promptly dumped her. But I really enjoyed it, so I wanted to like, explore more of what uh, that director had in store. Weirdly enough, though, for Paul Thomas Anderson, like, again, Love There Will Be Blood. I watched that actually twice in the theaters because I liked it so much. It's depressing. It is depressing. The saw the master saw phantom thread uh the magnolia was something that took a while for me to actually see it was just on my uh, list of shame to have having not seen it for a while this is why justin's on this podcast the first time i saw it with just was with justin at his house when me uh him and another friend of ours daniel had our manly movie nights where we would watch movies like this <laughs> so the of, laptop was still working it's still time. working it was great I'm and just imagine three of you crowded <laughs> around the a lot like a dell a dell laptop from like 2002 <laughs> yeah the reason we watched it is i just said i there's one movie i can watch <laughs> <I'm just laughs> that's it <laughs> and this is why i love the uh, letterboxd app so much is that i can actually tell you the exact date that that was justin which was May 25th of 2014 is the, yeah. Wow. So that, so that is the date that we, (laughs) that we watched that movie together. Um, Loved it. Thought it was great. And I'm really looking forward to revisiting this movie here again and seeing if I still think it holds up. What is it like in a post Trump era? I guess we will, we will find out. Uh, so let's do this. I'm going to go thank some sponsors, and then when we return, it'll be our conversation about Magnolia. Hey there, everyone. Just Kyle, jumping into the middle of the podcast again to tell you about some of the people that help make this show continue going. 
Yesterday here in Calgary, it was 16 degrees Celsius, what is normally like a late spring, early summer day here. This may be the first and only time that I've been able to wear flip-flops outside in December. And that's right, I like to wear jogging pants with flip-flops, so sue me. One thing that uh, our guest Justin does not talk about in this episode, because we did record this just over a month ago, he did not talk about the fact that he started a new podcast of his own that I think you should go and check out. Uh, as of this recording here, at least, the second episode just came out. The podcast is called That Was the Worst Podcast Ever, and it's a show devoted entirely to the music of Sufjan Stevens. I've only been able to listen to the first episode, but I've really enjoyed it. As a huge Sufjan fan, uh, it is right up my alley. And if you're not a Sufjan fan, you should be. And then you should go and listen to this podcast. It's very good. It's That Was the Worst Podcast Ever, available really anywhere you can get podcasts. But of course, Kyle and Dave vs. The Machine is a proud member of the Alberta Podcast Network, locally grown, community supported. The Alberta Podcast Network promotes and supports Alberta-made podcasts and connects their audiences with Alberta-based businesses and organizations. This week, we're brought to you by ATB, and I want to tell you about ATB's new podcast, The Future Of. You can join Todd Hirsch, ATB's Vice President and Chief Economist, as he connects with special guests who offer unique and useful perspectives about the future. Explore how our economy and communities can not only brace for change, but embrace the opportunity it creates. From the future of women in business to the changing nature of work itself, the future of helps us understand what's coming and what we need to do today to get the tomorrow we want. Featuring two episodes each month plus bonus episodes, the future of includes interviews with top community and business leaders from Alberta and around the world. Subscribe to The Future Of in the Apple Store, Google Play, Spotify, and everywhere podcasts are found, and connect to ask your questions about the future by emailing thefutureof at atb.com. This week, we are also brought to you by the Alberta Podcast Network, so let's go and listen to one of our other great shows. Hi, I'm Emily. And I'm Brienne. And together we make Emily Missed Out, a podcast where Emily and I dig into the long list of films that Emily hasn't seen. It's a very long list. Totally long list. And help her catch up on all of the pop culturally relevant lines, characters, scenes, and tropes that she may have missed out on. We're also a proud member of the Alberta Podcast Network. You can find us online at albertapodcastnetwork.com or wherever you find your podcasts. Join us for my pop culture education. Yeah. Well, that was a bit of a marathon, but we did it. We watched the movie in a not as non-spoilery as possible. Justin, what is your perspective of Magnolia? My perspective of Magnolia is that it's not a perfect film. Actually, I think there's a novelty uh, in 1999 to weave stories that don't seem to be connected but with the reveal at the end that there's some thread through it all. To me, that was really novel when Paul Thomas Anderson did it. I think now it's a little bit, you know, I think Crash did that. You know, you yeah. just see. Well, this is almost like the, um, oh my God, Pulp Fiction did this basically too. Uh -huh. It's like, oh, how is all this going to like fit together sort of thing? It was a thing in the 90s though, I feel. It was like, ooh, look at this, like multiple storylines. They're all going to intersect, uh -huh. right? <laughs> yeah. And there's things that, that to me haven't aged really well, but the part that I will, that will last forever is the connection you feel to the characters. And some of Paul Thomas Anderson's uh, directing choices, I think, are fantastic. And the acting is, I think, mm -hmm. is off the charts. So I feel emotional every time I watch it. I feel like it, it makes me, honestly, this experience watching it, I, it made me want to be a, <laughs> this is so stupid to say, it made me want to be a better person. Wow. Okay, wow, wow. <laughs> Look at, wow. Put that on the poster. We have not run into that yet, Kyle. That's incredible. The last time I watched it was probably that May 25th, 2014. And now I have older kids. And so some of the themes in the movie of kids dealing with 
the trauma or pain that their fathers have passed on. So watching it now that my kids are older, it re- I basically was like, I want to go home and not screw up my kids. <laughs> So, well, you've already <laughs> failed, Justin. So. Um. <laughs> but that, that just watching it today, that's my initial thoughts was it, yeah. those things hold up for me. I th- yeah, I do think that there is that resonant through line of all the interactions with fathers in this movie. I am not a father, although I do have one. So there, I think I am only getting maybe part of that you know, puzzle piece, so to speak. But Dave, you're also a father. What is your feeling of magnolia in the year 2020 have we already reviewed american beauty yes okay so i felt uh more impacted even though i didn't like that movie nearly as much uh by the parental relationships in that movie because uh you know that's pretty strongly negative one Mm -hmm. um this one, I agree. I mean, uh, number one, whatever I feel about this movie, the acting is insane. I, I, there isn't a single uh, performance in this film that, maybe I'll put it a different way, um, the Academy fucked this up by giving an Oscar to Michael Caine. Yeah, this because, is going to be our uh, recurring theme with this. Is like, <laughs> yeah, we've, we've now, this is like probably the fifth time we've mentioned this. I love Michael Caine. I don't even know how he was nominated in this year. Crazy. What, what film was he win. nominated for? The Cider House Rules. Oh, right. The Cider House Rules was like the darling of 99, I feel like. I know. Oh, and I don't get reason. it. I, after having seen it, I don't get it. Yeah. I don't understand why people like that movie. <laughs> like, I think most of the main supporting actor and actresses did get nominated, but you could have gone across the board and give multiple nominations for each of the actors, I thought. Uh, P.T. Anderson's a great director, so uh, some of the technical things, and it's a beautiful film. Yeah, and, he's always uh, able to give these really, or he's able to, I don't know, encourage these phenomenal performances. I don't get it. Like, in almost every movie I've seen of his, it's like, whoa, like, how did he get this performance from this person? Ex- yeah, I think Paul Thomas Anderson got the best performance from Adam Sandler that he'll ever give. Tom Cruise, I think this is Tom Cruise's most fantastic acting of his career. Yes. And then I, th- I, agree. I think the same of Joaquin Phoenix and Daniel Day-Lewis. He gets the Hello, best Daniel. performances out of actors. I mean, Daniel Day-Lewis is Daniel Day-Lewis. But no, but uh, <laughs> he was very good in, uh, in that other reasonably good movie that we <laughs> mentioned. Uh, no, I... Uh, You're just jealous of Paul Dano. I was... Uh, when, Tom, uh, when, Tom, when Thomas Cruise uh, first appeared, it reminded me of the reveal in Tropic Thunder, uh, <laughs> where I was like, you know, this is where it comes from. He uh, yeah. he's actually can be quite a funny guy. I thought it was very good. I was sucked right in for the three and ten, three and eight, three hours yeah, and three eight, hours minutes, and eight minutes, minutes, we just I sat, think. sweating into this couch together, covered <laughs> in frogs. Uh, as a non-spoiler, I think I'll stay there. For for me, I guess we're in agreement in just the abstract in that I I really love just being a part of this world. I think what draws me in the most is each individual character seems so fully realized. And so I do want to learn more about them, see where they ultimately end up. Now, what I was doing on our way back here to the microphones was actually looking up older reviews and specifically watching old clips of uh, Roger Ebert talking about this movie, because this is one of his favorite movies from 1999. Most critics actually did like this movie, but there was a very strong contingent saying that this was actually the worst movie of 1999. Uh, So there was a little bit of disagreement with critics going on. What I do enjoy, again, as non-spoiler as possible, is that what this movie is doing that I love is that it intentionally sets you up believing that it's going to end in a specific way and then completely uh, rips the rug from out underneath you to be like, actually, we're not actually even concerned about that. <laughs> we're going to we're gonna do it in a different way. And specifically, uh, when Justin was saying that there was these multiple storylines, in most of these movies, everybody ends in the exact same spot uh, at the exact same time. And that's not really what happens. There's an event that everyone experiences, but they're not all in the same spot. They're not all convening in the same area. And I think that the way that that like what that actual ending is, is either going to frustrate you so completely because it does somewhat come out of nowhere or 
if you're like me, you're like, I love the absurdity of this, that this is how they decided to do it. Uh, and that, and thus it kind of ends as its own like tall tale, just the way that this movie opens up where they talk about these three like coincidences that, that happened. So there's, there's that part that I like. The, th- the two small criticisms that I'll throw out. Um, I have to slightly disagree with you, Dave, about every acting being great. Because there's one that I actually think is a little bit um, subpar. And it's from an actress that I normally love, which okay. is Julianne Moore. I, me too. Okay, Kyle, I wasn't going to say it because I didn't. Yeah. But I, for some reason, Julianne Moore... My impression I got was acting. I am acting. Yeah. Like, I just I, I kept this... feeling that through the performance. Yeah. Hers doesn't feel like a lived in role again, which is weird because normally she is like great in anything that I've seen her in. So I, I don't know. There's something that kept pulling me out. Now, to be fair, her role is incredibly underwritten. Like there's not much for her to do rather yeah. than other than to be like crying the entire time. So right. I kind of get it. But. Really? Like I, mean, number, I mean, number one, you're talking about knowing where this is supposed to end, which is insane because this movie had no direction. And number two, Julianne Moore's character is supposed to be this sort of like bipolar, schizophrenic, unhinged woman who uh, is scattering all around for getting these meds. We don't really even understand what the, her character is, but how could you play that differently if you were acting? It might have I been think the what writing. I'm getting, it could have been, yeah, it could, it could be. Paul Thomas Anderson's mistake here. I, I think it's more one of those things where you can tell like an actor is gunning for an Oscar. Uh-huh. <laughs> That's what it feels like to me yeah. where it's like, um, unlike, I don't know, even, even con- uh, contrasting here in this movie, you have like Jason Robards who really just has to lay in a bed and, and talk to people. But I believe every moment that he's in, like he's actually an old guy dying in a bed. Whereas Julianne Moore, I feel like I can see the acting choices she's making while she's making them. It does not feel like a character who's strung out on meds. It feels like I'm an actor who is pretending to be strung out on meds. Mm-hmm. Like wow. it's, it's a very slight change there, but it just doesn't feel as real as what everybody else is doing. And what I mean by not necessarily knowing like the exact ending, I know that when I watch Pulp Fiction, that everything is going to kind of end up back in that cafeteria scene or well not specifically the cafeteria scene but i know all of those characters are going to be meeting each other throughout the entire thing there's some characters that don't meet each other no i think that's hindsight maybe but i mean you're at a certain point halfway through that movie when every other character has met another character it's like okay well they're probably gonna all do that that's actually one of the biggest criticisms actually that this movie got back in 1999 is that it doesn't end the way that those other movies end where there is no intersection with the characters by the end of the movie. And that's actually part of the thing that I like about it is that it's the event that everyone experiences. It's not them actually meeting each of the other characters. Mm -hmm. Occasionally the characters cross paths, but that's actually not the main point. It's the event that happens that causes everyone to have a sudden realization in their own storyline. And some of the connections are just, um, throwaways like um tom cruise's father in the movie he's the exec or the producer behind the game show so that's really the only connection between those two story points so they're tangentially connected and then paul thomas anderson said it was in the script that they were all within a mile radius of each other right but that that never really gets said in the movie this is my point i I think too i mean i don't know if we're getting too deep into this on the overview but you know, when you set up a movie with two, three minute setups where it is going to converge, it, particularly the uh, murder suicide uh, yeah. little story, um, then having to wait three hours for him to be like, you know what, go fuck yourself. It's not going to happen. <laughs> uh, that to me is not intelligent writing. That to me is uh, it's just being an asshole. And you know a thing or two about being an asshole. We'll get into well, it a little bit more yeah. uh, I mean, deeply, I, think I guess. One, one, of the ma- it, but. one of the major themes, though is like what is chance and what is like uh, this is actually not exactly what they say but it's basically them saying what is something that is developed by chance and what actually has a deeper meaning and i think what paul thomas anderson is going for is that all of these like chance things that are happening in this story is up to you to decide whether or not there is a deeper meaning to all of these stories Uh, or that maybe maybe that's what part of the theme is i think that that setup is gearing you towards being like oh yeah there's going to be like this wonderful conclusion that 
is going to be this very pat and like I can like wipe my hands and be like, cool, I uh, I'm being taken care of Hollywood. And he's rejecting that specifically and being like, maybe there isn't any deeper meaning to this. Maybe they all have their own choices that they can make in their lives and they can either choose to break free of them or succumb to them. That's to me kind of like what part of it all is about anyways we'll talk more about that because (laughs) we're talking around a topic instead of actually talking about the topic let's do some background information magnolia was released on christmas day of 1999 also released that day was actually quite a few movies but one that we've already talked about is galaxy quest directed by dean pariso written by robert gordon and david howard starring tim allen sigourney weaver alan rickman and sam rockwell but it also is when The Talented Mr. Ripley was released, written and directed by Anthony Minghella, sorry, Minghella, starring Matt Damon, Gwyneth Paltrow, and Jude Law. Currently, it is rated 8.0 on IMDb. It has a 77 on Metacritic. And then over on Rotten Tomatoes, as of 147 critics, it's at 83%. And users, 192,966 of them, it is at 89%. Uh, it's available on DVD or Blu-ray. You can buy or rent it on iTunes. You can also rent it on YouTube, but it is not on any streaming platform, at least here in Canada. Stars. Yeah, we're stars in this. Come on. Just a quick qu- I don't know if I've asked this before, but from a mathematical perspective, mm-hmm. is Rotten Tomatoes that if you give it 60% or higher as an individual, it counts as a fresh rating, and then that accumulates into the so the, there, there's a lot of weird math that happens there in terms of stats it no so this is comes down to interpretation only in that what Ryan tomatoes is doing it's just saying that 83 percent of the 147 critics gave it a positive rating but that mm-hmm. positive rating could have been what you just did dave which is like i like part of this but other other parts of this was complete shit so all you have, and so if it's kind of like that mixed review, that still kind of gets into the positive column. Yeah, well, I'm you just bringing up because what was it? Cider House Rules or American Beauty? They were like at 95 percent user score, and it's yeah. impossible because that movie is not a 95 percent movie. But uh, regardless, I'll stop uh, talking. Yeah, its budget was 37 million dollars. It opened in very select theaters. I think it probably just opened up in New York and LA because its opening weekend was $193,000. But domestically, it would go on to make $22 million, And internationally, it would make another $25 million, uh, bringing its total up to $48 million, which is $75 million with inflation. So wouldn't have been a great return on their investment. Yes, it made more than its budget, but uh, not probably more than its marketing budget, so it's probably going to be considered a failure as far as Hollywood is considered. Uh, its plot description from IMDb is an epic mosaic of interrelated characters in search of love, forgiveness, and meaning in the San Fernando Valley. <laughs> what a great description <laughs> of so this funny. movie. Um, I couldn't figure out how to actually pare this down as far as like who stars in it. Or sorry, the machine couldn't figure out how to pare down who stars in this movie. So let me take a big breath. This stars John C. Riley as Jim Curring, Tom Cruise as Frank Mackey, Jeremy Blackman as Stanley Spector, Philip Baker Hall as Jimmy Gator, Philip Seymour Hoffman as Phil Parma, William H. Macy as Donnie Smith, Jason Robards as Earl Partridge, Julianne Moore as Linda Partridge, and Melora Walters as Claudia Solomon. Some of those people we've already talked about, Tom Cruise, we mentioned back in our Eyes, Eyes Wide Shut. Shut episode. We've also talked about William H. Macy back in our Mystery Men episode. So you can go and check those out in your podcast feed. But do we want to, what do we want to say about any of these other actors? I'll make a quick note because you guys have already fanboyed PT uh, mm-hmm. Anderson, but your favorite movie in, what is it, Inherent Vice, actually got nominated for two Oscars too. I didn't look up for what, but. Uh, I think it was, I think I think it was makeup and production design or something like that. Yeah, yeah costumes or something. As a nomination. I think I saw a YouTube video too that Phantom Thread had no cinematographer and he just did it uh, on his own. My strong opinion, by the way, of Phantom Thread is that it should have won for best score that year. But... Yeah, fantastic score. Johnny Greenwood from Radiohead. Yeah. Yeah, it was great. I listened to it all the time. 
I will say quickly, Jason Robards actually like died the year after this movie yeah. came out. So talking about him acting well as a dying man, I mean, uh, yeah, yeah, hey, that's, that's method, that's man. Thing. He went full method on <laughs> this, and he he passed away shortly after of cancer. Mm. Yeah, I think it was. Uh, yeah, it's pretty. Yeah, method, I guess. Uh, uh, how about John C. Riley though? Like he, I for me, John C. Riley's career is so interesting because he started off very heavily in like dramatic films, yes, and then kind of veered off into comedy, uh, and kind of does drama every so often again, but really kind of has two distinct careers. I see. You see that in this movie because mm-hmm. he's both. He's like a tragic clown. Right. I mean, Chicago too. There's just something about him that you want to cheer on both ways. So uh, I think he's hilarious because he can play. It's kind of a little bit like, uh, what's Dumb and Dumber? Jeff Daniels. Oh, right. Jeff Daniels. There's a little bit of that, right? Where when he goes like stupid, he can go all the way stupid. And sure. then when he does drama, he can go the other way. The mm-hmm. surprising thing with John C. Riley is he hasn't won any awards, which I think- No, he's also really interesting. I, I think I've now mentioned this podcast for the, like the last three episodes, but he also did an interview with Mark Marin on the WTF podcast. This was probably like three years ago. And what's super fascinating about him is that he straight up does not like talking about his process or about the acting profession at all. And so that interview is so weirdly structured because Mark tries to ask him questions and then they end up just talking about Laurel and Hardy for most of the episode because John C. Wright <laughs> will not answer questions about his own process. Wow. He just doesn't want to talk about it does he say why i i remember him saying that he just finds it a supremely self-serving and boring when actors talk about how <laughs> they do what they do yeah uh, and he just doesn't he just thinks he's a, a boring person so he prefers not to talk about himself well but i think he's in this movie the rumor is that he went to pt anderson and said could you write me a, a, a character that's not dark that isn't mm-hmm. heavy because he was playing a lot of heavy roles and he said could you write me a character that falls in love so that's the rumor is that paul thomas anderson just wrote this for him and also the other thing is new line cinema campaigned for john c Riley for best actor and did not campaign for anybody else well their efforts certainly paid off for best actor everybody else was best supporting actor supporting yeah, yeah yeah so i don't know why they were pushing john c Riley's to to get an award for this which i think He's fantastic in it. Oh, yeah. But yeah. Com- Tom Cruise is the... Anyway, that's the performance <laughs> that stands out to me, but... It is, yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. Really? I mean, they're all good. There's something... Have you heard of a movie called Manderley? Anyways, apparently he, John C. Riley quit it because they were going to kill a donkey on set. Oh, wow. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, so he has... Good times. He has morals. He has morals. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's like you know we we talked about the extreme filming conditions uh on three kings right where george clooney basically like slapped the director because they were he was yelling at like the support staff there's people out there that are good <laughs> supposedly yeah, well apparently pt uh pt is not a very nice guy either oh really um, there's, Honestly, yeah, yeah there's some rumors about uh so apparently he was dating fiona apple during this movie which is why she's in this movie uh like her music yeah and uh, and Amy Mann, right? Isn't Amy Mann also? Well, on uh, Fiona him? Apple plays the voice of of the lady on the phone, right? And ah. kind of lends her for. And then the DVD commentary, which I know well because it was the only DVD in my computer, <laughs> is there are so many see, like real life documentary footage of PT Anderson with Fiona Apple, kind of lamenting the criticism about the length of the movie and and all that. But I'm sure, Dave, you're getting to the Fiona Apple quote that I think came out recently. Is that what you're? Yeah, I guess so. About uh, them being strung out and uh, there's some, being some violence and uh, all this stuff. It's followed. I mean, I, I, it's just gossip, but I, I followed it up because apparently Daniel Day-Lewis described him as his evil twin brother. Okay. And uh, Daniel Day-Lewis is not, <laughs> does not seem like the most stable guy uh, Right, you know, as a as a barometer, so it is an interesting uh, color. Uh, but we saw with David, uh, which David Fincher? Yeah, yeah, David Fincher. You know, Price of Genius, maybe. There's I get. Well, there. I don't really love that excuse very much about like, oh, he's a genius, so he can just do whatever he wants. Oh, but... they're not allowed. I mean, that's why gossip exists. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think with Paul Thomas Anderson, he's certainly a director that has a strong vision, 
and he's not go- Magnolia particularly is New Line Cinema saying you were a cash cow with Boogie Nights. We love you. You make whatever you want now. And that's Magnolia. Yeah. It basically New Line Cinema gave Paul Thomas Anderson no parameters and they Yeah, blank check here. Go do what you want. Blank check. Paul Thomas Anderson edited the trailers for it he designed the Hmm. poster for it so it does kind of make you think he was probably unhinged a little bit on this movie and fiona Hmm. apple's comment was i forget exactly what she said but she said you don't know what it's like to have to be around quentin tarantino and paul thomas anderson doing cocaine and she just said it's a nightmare (laughs) <laughs> I cannot imagine. I could just cannot imagine. I will say, while we're on this topic, I do think that, like, the music in this movie is basically its own character. I, I really love the soundtrack this entire movie. I wrote down in my notes that essentially, for at least the first two hours, this is basically a musical. Like, the way that they use music as underscoring, but also to play in the scene. And yes, there's that scene where, like, all the characters sing along to that one song that's on the radio. Like, this is essentially a musical for those first two hours. It's structured like one, and they use music like one to advance story and to comment on what's going on in the plot already. Just quickly, Philip Seymour Hoffman, we know, tragically. Yeah, tragic end. But yeah. uh, the, the other Philip, Philip Baker Hall, who we've already seen in The Insider, great character actor who's been in a bunch of things, is like 90-something now and still is working and being in films. He's one of those guys who... Probably most people don't know his name, but you know his face because he's in so many things when you just, look at his career. He's a great old man. He just plays an old man really well. Yeah. This is kind of the career. I mean, not everyone can become like leading man Tom Cruise person, but like the Philip Baker Halls of the world have a great gig, right? Because what do you get to do? You do like six movies a year, six to eight movies a year. You get paid fairly decently to come on and just like do your thing and uh, you usually just knock it out of the park it's like it's a great little gig this is of course written and directed by paul thomas anderson we've already talked about him uh just to put a fine point on that started making short films made his first feature in 1996 called hard eight did boogie nights did this film spent some time directing music videos for Fia- fiona apple and amy mann uh, which is probably why a lot of their music ends up in this movie then did Punch Drunk Love, There Will Be Blood, The Master, Inherent Vice, Phantom Thread. And then has, in the past few years, just done a bunch more music videos for Radiohead and Haim. Uh, and there is this untitled project that is currently filming to be released supposedly in 2021, but who knows, set in, hey, the 1970s San Fernando Valley. Woo-hoo! This film follows a high school student who is also a successful child actor, and it also has Haim in it as well. So... <laughs> you get to uh, experience more of that. I feel like you said that passive aggressively. I feel there's a lot of nepotism that goes along with Paul Thomas Anderson. <laughs> I- imagine if that were a theme in Hollywood. <laughs> yeah. By the way, I so egregiously was mistaken last week when I said that Sam Mendez was married to Maya Rudolph. Remember when I said no. that oh, stupid no, that's thing PT. last week? Yeah. Paul Thomas Anderson. That's, yeah, that's Paul PT. Thomas Anderson. That's who yeah. she's married to. Wrong tour. I got the wrong tour. <laughs> every time I see Maya Rudolph on SNL, it, is, it messes with your brain to be like, she goes home at night and to Paul, Paul Thomas, Thomas Anderson. Anderson. I, it's like it's such so fanboys. Well, it's no, crazy. No, no, it's, it's just unbelievable. Like this. Suckling at the teat. It's hilarious. <laughs> no, it's just so weird <laughs> to have like some guy who is known for like highbrow, uh-huh. like intricate films, and then like Maya Rudolph, who is like doing like I'm doing funny voices over here on Saturday Night Live. Wow. Yeah, like, she's like, home. I just did a sketch on jeans that like hide your farts. Farts. And he's yeah, just like, like that's, that's great, that's sweetie. Great. <laughs> wow anyways wow. We'll, we'll let we'll let the the audience decide how yeah. pretentious you guys just oh, came oh, off there, but that's no fine. i'm pretentious this is gonna get <laughs> dave this is gonna get even worse you just wait oh, i don't know if we have enough time <laughs> yeah we might not have enough time so um i guess we'll start off this far section let me talk about one other thing that i do think i need to criticize about this film so as much as i like about it i do have to admit that the last hour drags pretty good. Um, I think the first two hours are perfectly paced. Like, I love the first two thirds of this movie. And then it gets a little convoluted. Well, not not even convoluted. It just gets dragged down by its own 
things that it wants to do. I really do think if they cut 15 to 20 minutes out of that last third, it would make for a stronger film. You still do everything that you want to do, but it kind of just like circles the drain a bit too much for me <laughs> in, in that third hour of like, yeah, okay, we get it. We understand where all these people are in relation. I don't know. I don't know if anyone else agrees yeah, with that. And Paul Thomas Anderson agrees with you <laughs> too. Because okay. on Mark Marin in 2015, that's exactly what he said. He said, I should have cut storylines out of this and and trimmed it down it's and that that's my criticism too is there's moments where it's too indulgent there mm -hmm. where to me paul thomas anderson being friends with amy mann or, or enjoying amy mann amy mann's music is just too much of a present like i related to garden state where the shins just are talked about too much in the movie you yeah, gotta yeah. listen to the shins oh it's gonna change your life and it's so like silly. Do you guys think the prologue and the epilogue, is that what you'd call it? Sure. Yeah. The, I, I'm not, those are indulgent to me. I, I think they're oh, yeah. cool. And I think they set the tone and the mood. And, and like you said, Kyle, it kind of sets up the themes, but it's long. And maybe he didn't have to do as much as he did there. Well, I guess the best part of that, like, I don't know. I, I'm trying to do this quickly in my head. I think there's essentially like the five main storylines. But are there any that you enjoy more than others? Like if you had to rank them, like how would you how would you do it? Well, sorry, I thought uh, I thought you guys were going to keep going there, uh, suckling at that teat. <laughs> I, uh, I, I don't know. I haven't really thought about it that way. Uh, I'm just trying to think of what you guys just went off of. I, as far as trimming... The fat, and I guess you're asking a similar question, is there something from a general plot construction that stood out? I mean, I don't know. It's hard to tell because all of the actors were good in whatever they were asked to play. Yeah. So do I think that a particular storyline could have removed? I think all of the storylines should have been removed because it doesn't make any fucking sense at the end of the movie. <laughs> I think that there's uh, something I read about the intentional, uh, what is it? The absurdist movement that started after existentialism. So like plays and uh, films and things that were invented to uh, elicit this response that weren't supposed to make sense and that were supposed to uh, be upsetting. And I think we're seeing with the three of us uh, the power of uh, the intention of that, which is when you leave it up to the viewer to decide, then you can have, uh, I just gestured at the two of you, people that are going to read whatever they believe to be the intellectual intent of something in it. And people like me who are going to look at it and say, I, I think it's, it is pretentious, the entire thing. And if it weren't for the acting, uh, I would definitely hate this movie. It just... It doesn't go anywhere for me. It's a it's a loaded question. You just ask me. I don't know. I, I, what I've observed, and correct me if I'm wrong, because if you completely disagree with me, that's that's I'd like to know. I find that oftentimes, Dave, you look you look at a lot at the text, but no subtext, because you often say that there is no subtext to things. Where I will contend that sometimes I try and find subtext when maybe there is no subtext to to be found. I just think that there is too much intentionality placed with we were talking before we even pushed record like the numbers eight two, the biblical verses that are stated throughout this movie. I mm -hmm. think that he is driving at something about the relationship between sons and fathers. Yeah. Whether any of that resonates with you is a different thing. But, but for me, I think he is trying to show five, we'll say five different storylines of fathers and sons and the, the specter that your father has over you. Yeah. Um, but I mean, the, for me, even there's ones I think work better than others that you probably could just cut out of this movie completely. Uh, I mean, just a quick response before uh, I'll stop talking about this. But if that were, if since that is likely the case, because you guys brought it up, I didn't catch it. Then isn't this movie written for a specific person? And therefore, am I not supposed to enjoy it? Because I mm. can't quote you a biblical verse. Right. Uh, I don't give a shit. And when you guys were seeing the subliminal messaging to, you know, promote the uh, the frog scene to uh, quote the fathers and sons, it's not just above my head. Uh, it's irrelevant to me. And uh, when you bring it up, it, because you guys are interested in it, I am interested in that. It is fascinating. But I don't see that in the movie experience itself. And I'll only see that in a conversation with uh, folks like you. And I don't think that that's a valuable movie watching experience for me. Uh, so when you, you're right, when you talk about subtext, I think often, you know, our brains are designed to 
uh, build things. So it makes sense to us. But I mean, I, I want to stay at the surface. I like I like being superficial. It's, uh, it's, a, it's, a, <laughs> sure. it's a nice place, place to, to live. live yeah. 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 No, I, the first time I watched the movie, I didn't get the subtext of it. By the way, I've been subtweeting you all during this podcast. But I enjoyed probably just the characters were lived in and real and I felt their emotions. And, and so I enjoyed it for that reason. And then once you, to be honest, it's not like I just got the subtext because I'm smart. I used the internet, you know, and the internet told me that the eight two references and, and particularly it's the whiz kid, Donnie Smith. Is that his name? That's William H. Macy. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. He, in his dialogue, he's the one that kind of, brings the subtext out the most when he says there actually is nothing wrong with confusing children with angels. And when he's throwing up and he says Exodus 25, and I know that it's all, I hear what you're saying. It's like, well, I'm not interested in the Bible or, or anything, but he's alluding to the idea of the sins of your, you're being punished for the sins of your fathers. And then the current whiz kid and how his dad is exploiting him and then you just realize and then at at the end with claudia i think her name is being abused by her father and that yeah. subtext i think makes the movie just better the more you watch it and i don't know if that's that's any appeal to you dave but it does give you rewatchability and it, it the subtext does allow you to catch it but i was with you the first time i watched it i I just was enjoying this, the characters. I wasn't entirely sure what the theme was or how they were connected. I think this is a, an important conversation just to have for, I don't know, reckoning with, with films like this. Because I, 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 another thing that we were remarking on is that I understand why someone would hate this movie. Like, it doesn't give you a lot of stuff. It is pretentious uh, in, in very many sections and stuff <laughs> like that. So I, like, intellectually, I get it. For me, I do enjoy films that I can appreciate more and more as I rewatch them. Maybe it's hidden messages. Maybe it's the intertextuality of things. That's a big fancy word from English literature that I use, which is basically this author is commenting on this other author, but you need to know the other author in order to understand what they're commenting on in the first place. Yeah. So it takes some, some knowledge coming into it. And I often go back and forth with this because I think... As an example, it drove me nuts uh, as someone who did actually like the Harry Potter books, going and watching movies where they would reference things that they did not build up in the movies. It's like, yeah, OK, like in the books, they talk about this, but you have not mentioned that in these movies at all. So how would anyone know what the heck is going on? And it bugged me in those movies when they would do that, because it's like you're just expecting people to know this coming in versus something like Primer. It was all on like uh a time travel, very indie budget movie, but it's basically actual theoretically valid way that time travel could work. But you have to understand like physics in order to understand what's going on in that movie because yeah. they do not give you anything to understand what is going on. Yeah. <laughs> um, so there's a, a certain joy, I think, for me for so for sometimes that working. But then I have the entire flip side of most David Lynch movies. Which is like, there's Mulholland Drive and oh, what was the other movie I watched from him? There's other movies I watch. I'm like, I don't know what is going on. Like, I straight up do not know what's going on. And what frustrates me the most, this is Mulholland Drive specifically, is like the ending, to, the ending is actually alluded to three times before the credits are over. I'm like, okay, like, I, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> Cool. Um, yep. It's like now a little, you know it was a little right insert. <laughs> it, was like, it was like a little insert in the DVD. And I remember just frustrating me. It's like, actually, the final solution is referenced in this scene. Uh, I don't know. It's just like, you are being so obtuse about this. Like, just say what you mean. Yeah. So, I don't know. I sympathize with it. I think it just, me I, I mean, to a much lesser extent, this is true for the Marvel films, where they throw little bones to fanboys all the time. It's like, ooh, they mentioned this character by name in this, and that actually references this. <laughs> and it's like, no one cares. No one cares about that. I care about it because it's like I read comics growing up, but like the general movie-going audience doesn't. So, I don't know. Does yeah. that make any sense to you, Dave? Well, I mean, the two thoughts I had is uh, the literal translation of presumptuous, which is to... Uh, you know, presume that somebody has the backstory or the context of right. what you're talking about. The other other thing I wanted to ask you guys is because we only did this off air is uh, 
Uh, maybe just you could explain to the listeners about the eight and two, uh, yeah. because uh, until you brought that up, when uh, the sky falls, I thought it was the dumbest thing I had ever seen. It's great <laughs> because it's so visually dramatic, but that's the point where I thought this absurd twist after the group sing along had gone too far, yeah. and I just didn't care about what it was trying to imply at that point. It, it was just. Uh, it wasn't even a funny visual comedy. It was just kind of right. disgusting. But yeah, maybe you could give us a little context. And, then, and I understand because yeah. at that point, and we can do spoilers, right? Yeah, yeah, we're yeah. spoilers. Oh, yeah. we're spoiling okay. it. Yeah, we're spoiling it. Because they all die at the at end. At this yeah. point of the movie, with the f- frogs falling, it's so out of left field. You're not expecting it. I predicted that was going to happen right at the very beginning. And I kind of feel that's the moment in the movie where you're either you're either going to be like, okay, that's awesome. I love or, it. Yeah. I wasn't expecting this. This completely subverted my expectations. Or it's going to be the moment you're like, I've waited two and a half hours for this. So I totally get it. And actually, Dave, the way that you describe uh, Magnolia is how I would describe Inherent Vice. It's like you're supposed to know something going into the movie to make it enjoyable. And I didn't know what it was. And apparently, he. it's like you're you're not in on the inside joke and you're watching everybody else laugh. That's how I felt with Inherent Vice. So I think sometimes Paul Thomas Anderson does alienate people. And I think it was just with Inherent Vice, I haven't read, who was it, Thomas Pynchon or what? Pynchon, yeah, yeah, for Inherent Vice. And everybody's like... He himself is a pretentious writer. Yeah, yeah. so (laughs) I get it. But to make it less absurd, the frogs falling is... When you understand the theme of basically being under some kind of oppression based on the sins of your parents. So you're you're being punished for the decisions your parents made. The most explicit is when it shows uh, the boulevard, this this uh, bus ad lights up and it just says Exodus 8-2. That to me is, it's not even that subtle. And in the the scenes of the game show, there's somebody holding a sign that just says Exodus 8-2. And Paul Thomas Anderson actually makes a cameo. He is like a security guard that like ex- escorts them out. So it's pulling on this biblical theme, which is the liberation of Israel from Egypt and the particular verse Exodus 8-2. And everybody tunes into the podcast for the preaching. That's right. That's <laughs> I'm right. not going to preach at anybody. Well, I, it, it, just so uh, everyone knows, like uh, every one of our audience members is actually very intimately knowledgeable about Exodus 8 too. Yeah, so, like, well, yeah. Well, that's our draw. That's our draw. <laughs> Old Testament. Yeah. Essentially, <laughs> all it says is, if you do not let my people go, I will rain down frogs on the land. And then if you if you read on, it just says frogs completely piled up everywhere and stunk up the land because. Egypt would not let the slaves go free. They continued to oppress. And so in the movie, I think what the frogs do is it's this statement that says, we need to be liberated from the decisions our parents made. We, we need to stop being punished. If, if our parents, you know, like the whiz kid or whatever, we need to be free from what our parents have done. And so Basically, the frogs is almost like the reckoning. It's the punishment. It's the, and it's also supposed to be the, I think, the freedom of people is now that the frogs have landed, you have some redemption or you do find. And I think the movie ends with redemption where people mm-hmm. get free, um, especially with Claudia. I think her name is as the movie ends on her and John C. Riley. And she has some hope, even though even though her dad probably just died in a fire. Like, did you guys catch right. up on that? Yeah, that's what I assume. I, but yeah, this is the thing about Hollywood redemption that bothers me too. Is uh, that is not a redeeming ending for her? <laughs> yeah, I mean, <laughs> the, there's the more road to that of story, trauma right? recovery for that woman yeah. uh, is just beginning, and it's going to be a horror film uh, because she never even gets to. Uh, Acknowledge, see her father acknowledge it before he shoots so him, uh, shoots himself in the head and and burns it. It's uh, you know all all of the storyline. I I understand where you're getting at. I don't. And number one, I mean, if you're not 
Christian or versed in it, then uh, yeah, it's it's an impossible context to understand. But here's and the second funny thing is, is, isn't that a presumption too that that there's a positivity at this at the end of this movie? I, I don't see a lot of resolution. I see more suffering. Uh, that's why I felt like I had a bad taste when I. Got I don't up. know. I think this is. I think you're right in in the criticizing of like this is a very Hollywood or like movies in general positive ending yeah because it's shorthand because it's like we would need another three hours to like unpack where they go to next john with, c with- riley and and they're not getting married and having kids and you know like that is totally ridiculous she still has a drug problem there he doesn't know about her drug problem all it is is a moment of hope but i think i think honestly what the the more important step there is that her mother acknowledges that that actually goes on because it yeah. seems to me that up until this point the mother has been secluding that yeah. as being something that even happened and you see like the uh zoom into the painting where like it actually happened like that's the painting that she created i don't know when but that she painted it actually happened yeah. and you even see like stanley standing up to his father like uh-huh. is that gonna like magically change their relationship probably not but at least He's made that first step to be like, I'm not going to be the wallflower who sits here and pees his pants anymore. I'm going to be someone who goes and says, hey, treat me nicer yeah. um, sort of thing. So I think it's so small, th- small <laughs> in quotes of those characters changing and being like, I have to accept certain things. I have to change where my the progression is going in my life. And I think that to me, we're going to get pretentious, Dave. I think that's exactly it's not the frogs fall and everybody's free. It's the frogs fall and people take one step towards being free. And even in the biblical narrative, Israel does get released from Egypt and then they just spend 40 years in the desert. So I I think what the idea is, is that nothing essentially sets us free immediately, but it's when we realize that we can take small movements, small steps to basically to become better than our parents were. (laughs) Well, and and one last thing, and I do want to hear what Dave has to say, which is, I think the other subtext thing, well, not subtext, the other layer of why I appreciate the frogs, because it is absurd and it is weird and odd, is that again, at the beginning of the movie, it kind of sets you up for that. Isn't it odd that this fire bomber picks up a scuba diver and drops him into the forest? Isn't it weird that this guy is going to commit suicide, but actually gets shot by his mother instead? So isn't it weird that just a bunch of frogs fall in L.A. in this one localized location and causes these epiphanies from like five different people? This is that's the part that I really dislike the most, which is that the absurd portions of the first intro sequences are things that could and may have actually happened. Yeah, but frogs Whereas have actually rained, rained down frogs- before. <laughs> and that, that's well, why really- Stanley says this happens because he. Yeah, yeah, I saw the. Yeah, but where, where, where did there that was, happen? It was like somewhere in the U.S. where the, a tornado sucked up a bunch of like tadpoles and then like literally frogs raid down on the. It city happens with tornadoes and hurricanes where it can suck up frogs and drop them. Not in that scale, obviously. But- no, not as many frogs as actually drop in this movie for yeah, sure. But it but has happened. Uh- I don't know. I it, it's so apolo- apologist to put it that way. It's it's ridiculous. And I you know, I, I didn't I didn't really pick I mean obviously the father son thing's a huge theme, but I thought to my mind it was I mean this is the same thing, but it was about denial. And for example, John C. Riley being blinded by his chase for companionship. I mean, mm-hmm. she they spent so much energy showing her like just Snorting not, a lot of coke, right? Yeah, like a lot and of it. Just constantly strung out. Like she's not even good at hiding it. But all <laughs> he wants is to see uh, what he wants to see. And I think all of the relationships hinge on that denial. You know, even with Stanley and how he's people pleasing through the whole thing, even though you can see is clearly miserable, he's both aware and uh, in denial of how much he's being taken advantage of. That for me was a stronger sort of, and I think it's part and parcel of what you guys are talking about, which is. Um, I mean, if we want to use the rhetoric of father-son relationships or these biblical terms, I mean, I think it's the same thing. I think uh, while the punishing part, uh, you know, suffering for the sins of the father is a very specific phrase, at the end of the day, all of the kids have a part to play in it too. And I think none of them are uh, acknowledging or at least able to acknowledge uh, what their past truly is. And if it's the moment of the frogs where we uh, we get this break where they can open that up. I mean, I don't know. I mean, if that's the intent of the film, great. It doesn't 
play in my mind that way because, uh, you know, at that point I just didn't care. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, but I think, like I said, uh, it's not a bad movie. I think those are powerful things that are well acted and well brought up. It's shot in a beautiful way that you're compelled to see it through to the end. And whether the payoff is important to the individual is, I think, a contextual thing. Uh, you know, learning how you are both seeing it and have read into it through secondary research, uh, you know, it's fascinating. I probably won't sit down for three hours to see if there's a payoff. I do like hearing that from you immediately after watching it, because then at least I can play back my mind and say, yeah, those things may have been there. And, you know, and, and then I'll just shrug and move on. I, <laughs> I actually, yeah. I'm quite... Like, I, I think one of the strengths of the movie is, like you said, well, for me, the only through line I that stood out to me was denial. I think that's a strength of the movie that you don't necessarily have to get it right. I think <laughs> this I think what I like about the movie is it forces you to be introspective <laughs> and it forces you to almost feel the movie and walk away with your own conclusions. Is that too pretentious to say? No, I think that's the allegedly the intent of absurd writing is that you're supposed to leave and just say, what the fuck? And then, yeah, like uh, I felt this way with the, uh, American Beauty and you felt this way about thinking of your family. Uh, even though that movie has nothing to do with the way I parent, I turn the movie off and I'm like, you know, am I doing this? Mm -hmm. And then I have to at least have this dialogue where, no, you know, I'm not yelling at my kid to study more and, and win me money on a game show, but yeah, right. uh, have I put pressure on him to live up to some standard that he doesn't understand? But, but, I'm, but am I making him watch Jeopardy every day? Absolutely. <laughs> Wrong uh. answer. Wrong answer. Yeah. So, um, but that's the power of the abstract, I think, uh, yeah. if you're engaged intellectually. I Otherwise, guess, you just, yeah. yeah. Off, I guess out. for me, like, we're, the types of movies I like are these types of movies where the acting is really top notch and there's some really great sequences and lines that I kind of align with and that I can dig in deeper if I want to have that experience. I guess I'm much more like plot focused than, than anything else because oftentimes, Another person who gets criticized for being pretentious is um, Terrence Malick. And Terrence oh, Malick man, is frustrating. Yeah. yeah. And <laughs> Terrence Malick is frustrating to me because it's like, okay, yeah, you've been dancing in this field and drinking dew off of leaves for like 10 minutes, but like, so what? Like, I don't, I don't care. Just because it's beautiful, this, Kyle. <laughs> I know. It's like he's great at composing shots that are absolutely beautiful, but it's like, I need a plot to carry me through this. So uh, ultimately, this movie might be the same thing. <laughs> where it has no meaning but at least i had fun along the way at least i didn't feel like i was uh, wasting my time that's again a very me thing yeah. but that's that's how i feel about wong kar wai i uh, right, i yeah. spent my whole life with people telling me he was the greatest director coming out of east asia and i was like i cannot i mean they're beautiful but i cannot stand any of his movies because uh, i feel the same way actually was right now i'm just like what what was it all for at least right. it wasn't three hours long but uh, <laughs> sure. yeah Beautiful I gotta, cinematography. Is, I got to yeah. know this, Dave. When you were watching it, and they start lip syncing, like it, when we're we're talking like two and a half hours into the movie, yep. it turns into uh, almost like a music video. I want to know, mm -hmm. like, what was going through your head when that moment happened? If I had breath, it would be baited right now. Uh, yeah. I mean, I I think once it started, I definitely groaned. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, without even touching the dials, like there, uh, there's easily another, I, I just have this feeling there's easily another hour left because they haven't resolved <laughs> anything yet. Right. Yeah, um, yeah. And, uh, but they're building, they're building to it. And uh, I think because of the sort of side reading I've been doing, that's when the word uh, abstract came into my mind. Cause I was like, now he's just making fun of me. Now it's just, it's turning into this joke where the director is looking at me through his film and having a laugh because he's kind of uh, teasing me that I've <laughs> lasted this long, right? And he knows that I'm going to wait to see if it's all going to go somewhere. And at that point, it became a challenge, I think, for me to uh, kind of what you guys are doing, find some connecting dots. But I was, I was pretty, not irritated is a strong word, but I was off put because mm. uh, there was no setup that it was going to go. Uh, that weird at that point, and yeah. it just got weirder after that for sure. But I, uh, I think that was definitely a point where I, I stopped enjoying it as a a movie movie, and it became more of a a game. Yeah. Right. What do you think of that uh, moment, Kyle? Those types of moments are what I call theatrical moments, where it's very much like we are breaking out into song and dance, 
which other movies have done that too. I remember like there's a moment in 500 Days of Summer where the Joseph Gordon-Levitt character just breaks out into song and dance and that never happens again in the film. And it totally works for me because I love theatrical things. It's probably why I like glam rock so much because it's like they're just putting on a theatrical show for two and a half hours. I'm down for that. So why it makes, why it resonates for me is that I think the song is commenting because what is, what are they saying? They're saying, um, one second. It's not going to stop. Till you wise Until you up. wise up. Yeah. And then the ultimate one is, uh, no, it's not going to stop. So just give up. So it's this thematic thing that they're kind of talking about, which is like, stop focusing on the past and kind of move forward sort of thing. Told in song, told from these separate points of view that I actually think is framed very beautifully. So it again, it just works for me. While also intellectually being like, I can understand why people would hate every second That's of this. That's how I feel. <laughs> it's like, I have... I have a Dave within me. And that Dave <laughs> is has a little Dave in them. We Everybody has yeah, a little. And do. that Dave is like, <laughs> I cannot believe this was a choice made and, and we're doing this. And then the other part of me starts listening to the lyrics and how it relates to each character. And then just the refrain of this isn't going to stop until we wise up. So somebody has to stop the dysfunction. Otherwise, mm. it just keeps going. So this doesn't stop. We pass on the sins of our parents to our kids and they pass it on. It doesn't stop. And then I just go, Paul Thomas Anderson, I love you. I'm in. You've done it again. You've do yeah. you done it again, Paul. You've done it. You won me over. And what's funny is with the frogs, the frogs in the song are particularly jarring, but it's almost a surprise and delight if you, if you buy into it. <laughs> that's the thing i mean this whole entire movie which we've basically been saying over and over again is that if you're in it for the ride it's great but if you ever get off of that at any point it's like i i'm, I'm okay so you can keep going this is what you need to do dave when it's raining get in your car put on the amy man song think about your parents and <laughs> drink a bottle of morphine and sing yeah, it yeah, yeah. and sing it and park and watch the raindrops on your windshield and just say it's not going to stop till we wise up shed a tear and then you go i get it i get this i think i think justin uh, if you knew more of my backstory you'd realize i had spent the first 38 years of my life doing that and uh it's probably what makes me who i am today <laughs> well i think that's uh, but, wonderful uh, yeah. <laughs> we are we are running kind of long here like actually very long I, there's just three last things i just want to mention very briefly one i love the line reading tom cruise does for i will drop kick those dogs if they come I near know, me isn't that great? kills me he was improv that was an amazing sign yeah uh so funny the date that uh, john c Riley and um the, the, the other actress to... has <laughs> where it's like let's just get this all the way let's just like speak truthfully i've been on those dates before can oh, i just no. tell you and they are something else um and then hold on kyle yeah that sounds awful i'd be <laughs> i don't want that not on a first date no yeah it's like, let's just get all the piss and shit out of here oh, I'm like can gosh. we just have can we just have our coffee because i would I don't, I don't need to be a therapy session right this quick into do, this they, do you also do you ever go do you want to kiss me right now and then you kiss yeah, and then I leave really, really quickly, and you know, it depends on whether the coax. It depends whether the coax kicked in yet. So. That's right. Um, I also like it. It's very heartbreaking to me the way that William H Macy eventually gets to the conclusion of like, I have love to give, I just don't know where to put it. Yeah. And boy, I don't know. Not to get too far into uh, first date territory here, but that is something that is like constantly on the top of my mind. It's like as someone who is not in a relationship who wants to be, it's like mm. I don't know where to put this mm. emotion that I want to be having. Yeah. Um. Anyways. It's a great little sentiment. I don't you know if we need us. to delve into it. <laughs> you, you have us, Kyle. Yeah. You have podcasts. Love us. That's right. Love us. We're done here. All right. The <laughs> machine has asked us to wrap this up. Thank you so much, Justin. Justin, um, I feel so bad when I have to tell guests this. Uh, your rating doesn't matter. But if you had to rate this movie out of five, what would you rate it? Five. Oh, going to full five here. Okay. Uh, it might the, be for, my favorite movie. Kyle. This look is, at clearly that. is your favorite movie. <laughs> uh, Dave, you know this, but for the people out there that are listening, we have our Letterboxd page. You can go to letterboxd.com slash KDVSTM to see our full list of movies that we've reviewed here this season. I think this is number 48. 
if I'm not mistaken, 47, I think, actually, 47, this movie is. So we have a ton of movies over there. KDVSTM, of course, is also where you can find us on Twitter and Instagram. Uh, you can send us emails at Kyle and Dave VS the machine at gmail.com. And if you'd like to help support us so that we can maybe review more movies and give you more amazing content like this, you can go to our Patreon page. There is a link to that in the uh, description to this episode to help us out over there. Dave, I'm actually very curious because it seems like you're kind of like, like some of this, hate some of this. So what is your rating for Magnolia? Just a quick uh, follow up. Does it hold up? Oh, oh, I think it does. Yeah. I I've think there are some this. things that don't. Do you know what's jarring in 2020? What's that? A sympathetic police officer. <laughs> oh, that's oh, true. Oh, there we go. Like, <laughs> it well, almost seemed yeah. like you, that wouldn't, Unnatural, yeah. you couldn't do that in 2020. <laughs> not, not to this extent. No. Um, I, yeah, that's interesting that you brought that up. Cause I was thinking the same thing as like, when he was arresting the black woman who was also like guilty of killing people by the looks of it in her, in her house. I'm like, Oh, what is going to happen here? In this I scene? couldn't help but feel uncomfortable going through the year we've gone through just watching yeah. that interaction. <laughs> yeah, I know. I, uh, you know, I thought, was, I thought that interaction actually was really fascinating, but isn't there, I don't know. You guys know more. Isn't there a, a subplot with Orlando Bloom that was cut out where maybe he was the killer? Cause uh, that little kid that's rapping is trying to reveal to John C. Riley, that he knew what really happened, yeah. and there's that shadowy figure that runs back and forth, but it didn't. It didn't. Believe it or not, really there happen. are some things on the cutting room floor. <laughs> wow, <laughs> you know, you could have probably cut out that whole rap sequence then if they didn't ever come back to it. Um, <laughs> if it was Peter Jackson, we'd see the extended yeah. cut. Um, the, the other thing, can I just say? I was going to mention this, but the actual game show that they're on is so incredibly tough. There is that one sequence is like the notes were playing or in reference to picnic items. Like you have to know that's an E, a G and a G to spell out egg. I'm like, that is like so much tougher than any game show that has ever aired on American television. Uh -huh. well, like I don't get like, it's crazy to me. It's the absurdist element, right? Um, anyways, yeah. do you think it's like, do you think it's uh, culturally relevant? Do you think it's rewatchable? Um, I think it's eminently rewatchable. I think there's great stuff in this movie. Yeah, I mean, I, I, so I guess I would say, yeah, I think it still holds relevance for these themes we're talking about. I think that if someone had told me they didn't see it, I would tell them they ought to if they have three hours and eight minutes uh, to sacrifice to the film gods. If you only have three hours and seven minutes, sorry, you can't. No, you can't yeah, put it in. You're gonna, yeah, you're not gonna make it. I won't go as far as saying I will never watch it again, but I, I don't see why I would need to yeah. unless we do a 20 year reunion, Kyle, and we have to. I'm, I'm and, down for it. But it was, it was enjoyable. And I think, uh, at least for the humanist themes, it, it does hold up. It is an anachronistic movie at this point. Sure. Although they did have, they had Uber Eats, which I thought was fascinating. I didn't know you could deliver. Uh, I think I, to your door. I had that thought too. It I like think Postmates. that is just a. Gro I think that was just a grocery store that was offering that. Mm -hmm. I, it was what I intuited. It might be an LA thing. Maybe it's yeah, an LA it's, thing. Yeah, Who yeah, knows? it's fascinating. Head of the curve. It all, it all comes from. It's cyclical. Time is cyclical. We and uh, uh, do you uh, do you have uh, uh, the magazine Playboy? Oh, you do. Oh, you do. <laughs> okay. I love that. Was a good twist so too. Such a great yeah, that team. That little twist was great too. Where. You think that it's going to go one way because he keeps asking for porn and yeah. then turns out. Yeah. Like, yeah. It's like, do you yeah. still, do I still want the, uh, the bread and peanut butter? Still want yeah. The, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, it's funny. Oh. There's some funny. Yeah, it moments. is funny. There is oh, some yeah, funny yeah. bits. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. What a, I know you're trying to wrap up, Kyle. You can yeah. just edit this out. Uh, this is just me indulging. We won't. We won't. It's so funny when Philip, Philip Seymour Hoffman goes, it's like that scene in that movie where I'm looking for the guy and you're going to be the guy in the yeah, movie yeah. that I love. Yeah. That is that movie. I thought right? that was so funny. Yeah, that, thought, that's that's good. I mean, Tom Cruise is like a fountain of great. Like he is basically the id incel in this movie. Yeah, like yeah. everything out of his mouth is like, <laughs> boy, we're still contending with some of this thought process even to this day. But uh, yeah. And How fascinating. I thought it was fascinating to put that in context with how he became presented in public because the Oprah thing happened after this and, uh, right. you know, th I think there's, there's, yeah, there's a lot of layers. Tom Cruise, in fact, is straight. One of the quizzes, did you know, allegedly he held his breath six minutes underwater yes, for that for, Mission for Impossible, Mission Impossible movie. He trained himself. It's why it's he trained disgusting. himself to be actually fly as a pilot in the new Maverick uh, Top Gun film and how he's going to jump from space. <laughs> the guy um, is great. Anyways. 
out of so five, I, Dave, what are you going to rate this movie? Uh, you know, I, I need I need another three hours to think about it. So I'll uh, I've been actually mulling this over for uh, for this entire thing. I think you know for my personal feeling of angst at the end it's gonna drop but the performances are great so I mean, you know what? i'm gonna do a three and a half i uh i think you know, i, should I can never prove yeah. this but literally i was thinking i bet he's gonna give it a three and a half <laughs> <laughs> but i can't prove it so i'm not gonna well, say we've been that doing this long enough that i'm yeah. presuming you would get a feel because uh you're gonna go four and a half i think but yeah. let's see dave what i need to rate it then is this i think this movie is really really great but there are just a couple of things that are little nitpicks that prevent it from being a full five like Justin gave it. One is I still think that they could crunch down that third hour. It does not need to be a three hour and nine minute movie or eight minute movie. However, I am giving it a 4.5. It yeah. is near greatness for me. Uh, that means that it averages out to a four. It ties with five other films. So we have to figure out where this is going to rate. So from top to bottom, it ties with The Hurricane, Toy Story 2, 10 Things I Hate About You, Lock, Stock, and Two Smoking Barrels, and Go. I'll put it on top of all of those. Well, that's, that, that's not a fight. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, keep in mind, we talked about this. The rating system is flawed only that we're not doing it in genre. So, uh, well, I don't think you need to it, do it, it in gets genre, muddy. but yeah, it does get muddy sometimes. I, mean, 48, uh, I, I agree with you in that case. Like I was going to suggest at the very least, it needs to be at the top half of that list. So that means that entering our list at the number 11 position is Magnolia. Has this podcast been three hours long? I'm just watching Justin's reaction that it didn't make the top 10. I know. He didn't punch his computer screen yet, but... I, I knew it wasn't <laughs> just based on what you were uh, texting me as we walked over here to record, Dave, but... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> My apologies. I apologize. Uh, so again, thank you so much, Justin, for joining us here today. If people wanted to stay in contact with you online, how could they do so? I don't know why they would, but... <laughs> Justin Bills. Hey, we have to get those sweet, sweet Exodus tweets. Oh, man. Yeah. If, yeah, actually, just Justin Bills on Instagram and Twitter. But mm. yeah, for some great content. <laughs> some great A content. Uh, all right, Dave, I guess we should find out what we're going to be reviewing here next week. Let me just uh, push this button. Uh, oh, I, a movie I have not seen before uh, The Straight Story. Is what we're going to watch. It's directed by David Lynch. So I'm mm. sure it's going to be weird. Weird. <laughs> yeah. To, speaking of abstract. No, I've yeah. never heard of it. So yeah. I know the plot very briefly, but that's, uh, that's about all I know about it. Old man mm. drives cross country on a tractor. That's sounds all I know. Sounds great. Like yeah, a lawnmower like... tractor. Dave, really um, how are you at uh, Squash and Frogs? You know, I I, uh, I did my undergraduate in it, but uh, I haven't okay. yet to develop a thesis. So, although we did lick the backs of these, so I could have been just tripping for the last hour and a half. Well, well, I, I should make a mention about beards and your father, but we'll leave that uh, we'll leave that for the next episode. If I had breath, it would be baited right now.